Hello, everyone. I'm excited to be here. Thank you for joining uh, for this, co uh, for this um, call. It's not a call. It's not a Zoom call. It's an in-person. It's an in-person event. So this presentation is called Bumblebee or Higher Life to Learn to Stop Worrying and Love eBPF. Um, this is me. Uh, my name is Christian Fekete. I'm working uh, at Solo.io as a field engineer. Um, before that, I was working at LastPass uh, as a site reliability engineer. Uh, LastPass is the famous, infamous uh, password manager. Uh, you can read about many things um, currently. Uh, you can find my contact information on this slide. And uh, basically, this uh, presentation will be about my, my journey to uh, learn how to use eBPF uh, to some tasks that uh, without eBPF uh, I wasn't able to do. So as I mentioned, I'm working at Solo.io. Uh, on this slide, you can see uh, a company overview. The company is fairly young. It was uh, founded uh, some six years ago by Edith Levine. The company is a US-based startup, uh, but we have global presence. So basically, we have an EMEA um, field engineering and sales team here in, in Europe. Everyone is working from home. And uh, what we are doing is that we are trying to uh, make application networking easy and, uh, and scalable and uh, useful for, for developers and, and operators. Our um, products are, we can, we can call those open core uh, products. So most of those, all of those are based on uh, open source technologies and we have an enterprise subscription model for those. You can see some information uh, on my background here. Uh, as I mentioned, I was uh, an SRE uh, just before joining Solo. But as you can see, I had uh, multiple other roles uh, previously. Basically, if you take a look at that, you can see how this role evolved in terms of naming itself throughout the years. Uh, but I was always doing mostly the, the same thing. And um, as I mentioned, that's platform-related infrastructure stuff. But uh, my main focus was always observability. Originally, I started to operate without streaming clusters. Um, then after that, I moved to, moved to LastPass. And there I was monitoring, observing hundreds of virtual machines in uh, on-prem data centers. There were multiple uh, on-premise data centers across the globe. Um, and uh, these were serving tens of millions of users. There were also some Kubernetes clusters. These were running Istio. This is where I uh, first encountered Istio. And uh, after joining Solo, I'm, uh, I, I continued to, to work closely with, uh, with, this, with Istio and other open source technologies. eBPF itself is, is a quite hot topic nowadays. Uh, the hype is, is um, getting um, cooler, maybe. We can say that, because now everyone is talking about LLMs and AI and machine learning and things like that. But eBPF is still uh, very hot, uh, but the actual learning curve can be quite steep. Uh, I joined Solo in last April, so one and a half, about one and a half years ago. And after that, um, next to my uh, main responsibilities, I was also focusing on some eBPF, eBPF uh, specific uh, projects. So I made some contributions to, to Bumblebee, which I, will, um, which I will introduce in this talk, uh, and the open source BCC project as well. I will also mention BCC at some point. Uh, I created some eBPF workshops. So if you go to academy.solo.io, you can find some uh, free um, workshops on eBPF. There's two. There's uh, getting started, and there's an uh, intermediate one. So I really recommend checking those out because the this can make the <laughs> the learning uh, curve um, easier. And I also gave some conference talks on eBPF and other topics. And this is uh, a, a talk uh, like that. So what is eBPF? Who knows what eBPF is? There are maybe two, three, five, maybe maybe ten, fifteen. Fifteen, that's that's the most I can see. I'm not sure how many people are there, but uh, eBPF is um, not everyone knows what eBPF is. But just to give you a high-level overview, a very simple uh, 
uh, very simple summary of what eBPF is, is that eBPF is a flexible, safe, and fast way to inject custom logic into your kernel. So traditionally, if you wanted to do something like this, then you needed to um, build your own kernel modules. And if you made some mistake in that kernel module, that could break your kernel, it could break your instance, and that wasn't uh, very good. So eBPF provides a better way to do that. You don't need to recompile your kernel, you don't need to build kernel modules. And the promise of eBPF is that you can safely extend the capabilities of your kernel. And uh, if someone, was, someone has used a TCP done before, maybe if we have some people, okay, that's, that, okay, that's, that's uh, much more than uh, the number of eBPF experts. Uh, TCP dump is also based on BPF, which uh, relates to, to eBPF itself. There are four main categories um, for uh, eBPF uh, use cases. One of them is security. And if you think about it, security is quite trivial because you have kernel level access to your system. So you can basically inspect all the system calls that are happening in your, in your system, which is quite nice because you can monitor which syscalls are being invoked. You can see what processes are running on the kernel. So it's security is, is a trivial use case uh, for eBPF itself. Then there's tracing profiling. Um, since you have this kind of access, you can also get more information, more context about stack traces for certain processes. Uh, you can do proper profiling. There are some new continuous profiling tools out there using eBPF, for example, Parka. Uh, I really recommend checking that project out because I think that's uh, a great way to, to profile uh, your applications and uh, try to fix or try to optimize the, the code itself. Then there are networking use cases. If someone is using Cilium, for example, uh, who is using Cilium? Maybe there are some Cilium users here. One, two, three. No, someone was just maybe doing something like this. So two, <laughs> two people. So Cilium also is using eBPF to some extent uh, at its core. Uh, to uh, come over certain um, bottlenecks uh, at the networking layer. So that's another great use case um, for, for eBPF. And there's the fourth family, which is observability and monitoring. Uh, I mentioned that I was, only, I was always focusing on monitoring and observability. So this is the uh, family that I will um, talk the most about during this uh, session. Basically, observability is also quite real because you have this kind of access that I already mentioned. And with this, you can uh, extract um, extract the context out of the kernel with the resolution that you cannot really do uh, with traditional monitoring tool. That's just an edge case. There are some other cases where uh, eBPF-based monitoring can also help, and I will uh, show an example of this uh, through, the, uh, through the presentation. This is my favorite uh, diagram about eBPF because uh, it shows how the user space and kernel space parts of an eBPF programs are working together. Basically, you need both, so you cannot just say, okay, this is, this is my eBPF program, I will load this eBPF program into my, my machine, my, my Kubernetes cluster, for example, and that will just work. In theory, if you take a closer look, uh, in reality, uh, you will see that you need both a user space and a kernel space program to, um, to do anything eBPF related. The user program has certain responsibilities like uh, loading the actual uh, BPF bytecode into the kernel. Uh, and it also has other responsibilities like, for example, uh, visualizing the output of the code that is running in the kernel, handling user input, that's, that's another uh, use case. Uh, and we have statistics there because, yeah, it, 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 you have to also visualize what's happening uh, in the kernel. Then, as you can see, after you generated the BPF bytecode and you load it or try to load it into the kernel, there's a verifier. So now we are talking about the kernel space part of an eBPF program. And the verifier is the component that is there to make sure that eBPF is, is safe indeed. So without the verifier, 
uh, you could basically load anything into the kernel, and it's up to the capabilities of the programmer to to uh, to decide whether if it will um, crash the kernel or not. But since you have a verifier, if you pass the verifier, then we can say that there's a very, very high chance that it won't crash the kernel, which is not 100%, but it's much better than what we had before. After that, there's the BPF uh, box. Um, the BPF box is basically uh, the actual kernel space logic uh, that you can run on certain events in your kernels. In your kernel, uh, eBPF is event-based, so you can say, for example, okay, I have this, I don't know, five lines of code. It's written in C or Rust, for example, and I want to execute these five lines of code each time um, a certain event, event happens in my kernel. So as you can see, you can attach that logic to k-probes, u-probes, trace point performance. There are lots of different um, points, let's just say points in the kernel where you can attach this custom logic. But the, but the, uh, the logic is that if you, you have a logic and you have these events and you are executing this logic each time that event uh, happens. After that, your logic is executed, you have to put that data that you extracted from the kernel uh, into maps. There are various kinds of maps. I will talk about uh, a few uh, kind of maps that uh, you can leverage in, uh, in eBPF, with the eBPF. But basically, maps are the objects that you can use to exchange data between kernel space and user space. As you can see, there's, a, there's an async uh, read um, arrow at the bottom. So this is, uh, that's there because the user space program actually reads data from the maps. That you, that you are populating in the kernel space. So I think that's, that's a really nice uh, and easy way to understand at a high level how eBPF programs uh, actually uh, work. Why eBPF is important? eBPF is important because it can be the solution to impossible uh, tasks and scaling issues. Scaling issues if we are talking about, for example, certain network limitations. Um, it's possible that, for example, let's say you are a cloud provider, you are AWS or GCP, and you, at that scale, you can definitely hit some uh, scaling issues. And eBPF at that scale uh, can definitely make sense. And there are some other tasks as well. For example, if you are staying at the uh, observability category, then, for example, Catching all the out of memory exceptions in your in your car, in your uh, Kubernetes cluster, for example, is a problem that has some solutions. But without eBPF, there are lots of invisible out of memory exceptions that uh, that that you can cannot really catch, and uh, those will kill your applications. And if you are on call, then that's a very unfortunate situation when you it's 3 a.m. in the morning, you are getting pinged. Uh, you log into the computer, you look around in Kubernetes cluster, and you saw that, okay, you got, an, uh, you got some, for example, uh, an alert because your latency for one of your application increased, uh, but that increased because other ports uh, are dying in the cluster and you didn't really, uh, didn't even have an alert for that. So this is another uh, example where eBPF can help. EBPF is also important because it can benefit multiple personas, for example, application developers, uh, SREs, DevOps engineers, network operators, these all fall into the categories that I uh, described previously. In this presentation, I will focus on the SREs and DevOps engineers uh, personas. After that, okay, now we know that what eBPF is, now we know that why it is important, but why eBPF is scary. And dbpf is scary because it's the kernel. So nowadays there are Kubernetes engineers out there who are uh, getting into their first job without actually understanding what's behind Kubernetes. So if you t t tell them something like, "Okay, you have to you have to inject some custom logic into your kernel to to catch these edge cases," then they might not be ready for that. So hearing the word in 2023 kernel can be um, can be scary to some people. The next one is lack of documentation. 
Uh, um, has anyone maybe tried to look into eBPF documentation or just some looking up some guides to getting started with eBPF? There are a few. Okay, it's actually it's, it's more more uh, people who mention that they know what eBPF is. So maybe the learning curve is steep indeed if <laughs> uh, if they were scared away uh, even before learning what eBPF is. But yeah, the documentation is not that great. There's eBPF.io, which is not fine to start out, but uh, it has its challenges. And there are some cases if you if you try to uh, use eBPF long enough, you can actually avoid getting end up at the uh, kernel mail lists. And that's yet another thing that um, engineers, software engineers in 2023 uh, might not be that used to. Everyone is just joining Discord channels, Slack channels maybe, uh, taking a look at GitHub issues. But uh, what, what, is, what, is the, what is a mail list? Actually, there are some people who, who don't really have the, the context for, for mail lists. And another uh, reason why BPF can be scary is that since it's, uh, it's quite popular, there's a lot of emerging tools out there. If you, and I mentioned eBPF.io, which is a great starting point, but, oh, sorry. Uh, but uh, on the eBPF.io website, there are lots of uh, new tools. There's a new, there was a time, maybe at the end of, end of last year, in the, yeah, uh, in 2022, November, there was a conference in uh, Edinburgh, uh, Cube Huddle, the first edition of the Cube Huddle conference. I'm not sure if we have any, uh, anyone from, from that conference. Maybe, maybe not. But there were like six eBPF talks at that conference. Uh, I also had one, this one, uh, this talk, uh, the first edition of this talk. And I was sitting at the back of the, of the room uh, waiting for my talk. Before me, there was another eBPF talk. And I was making last minute changes to the slides because some context, some information was already mentioned at the previous talk. So it's still uh, very popular. And uh, especially back then, there were lots of new eBPF to uh, tools coming out every other day. But I think uh, this is the main reason why eBPF is scary, because it's the kernel. So let's take a look at the eBPF landscape. This screenshot is from, I created this originally when I was preparing for that conference, Hupadel, at the end of last year. And that was, I think that, Back then, this was a complete, uh, complete uh, screenshot of all the applications that are there. Are there are multiple sections at dbpf.io? You should check it out. But basically, there's an application landscape, and I think I was able to collect all the logos um, at the end of last year. Now, I might, it, it will be uh, more difficult to to do that because there's there's a lot more, but it's. This is also, it's, it's, it's not only two applications, it's not three, uh, it's, it's a lot. And um, it's quite hard to check all of them out and uh, compare those, um, start to uh, rando, uh, ran, um, install those randos and um, see, if it's, uh, see if it's worth or not. Uh, so getting started can be challenging. Uh, this presentation itself, as I mentioned, uh, will focus on observability. And if you want to focus on observability, we can borrow these lines of thinking from Brandon Gag, who is a very famous um, person in the eBPS space. He had this line when he said, uh, think like a sysadmin and not like a programmer. And this is about reusing existing tools and not reinventing uh, the wheel countless of times, each time over and over again, but to leverage the existing tools that we can have. So for that, we will focus first on BCC. Uh, this, is, this is the BCC project that I mentioned at the very beginning of the presentation. BCC is the original collection of eBPF tools that are aiming to solve observability challenges. You can see various parts of the stack on this slide, and uh, you can see various tools uh, at the end of the arrow. And basically, you can say that, OK, I, if I have, for example, an application issue, then I can, uh, no, application is not the best example, but let's say I have 
system libraries. And if you want, uh, if you if you have some system libraries related issue that you want to troubleshoot, then you can use get host latency, for example, to uh, look into what's happening uh, with those libraries with the help of eBPF. So this collection is, is on GitHub. If you go to uh, github.com iovisor uh, slash uh, bcc, then you will find all these tools. So you can start out with these. These these were created many years ago. Most of those were most of them were created by Brandon Gag, uh, but there are some challenges. Basically, with BCC, with the traditional BCC framework, you are writing a single Python program that contains the user, user space program and the kernel space program. The user space program is written in Python, and the kernel space program is written in C. When you execute this uh, Python program, then uh, BCC will call Clang LLVM on your system. It will perform a kernel header lookup, uh, look which is a quite uh, resource intensive uh, operation. Then at, run, uh, at runtime, it will compile your code. So if you are running on production and you don't want to waste money, you are running um, servers that are, let's say, 75% uh, uh, utilized in terms of memory and CPU. But let's say you have a production issue and you want to um, compile your little eBPF uh, code from the BCC repository to, uh, to solve that issue. Then if you are running at, I don't know, 65 or 75% uh, utilization, then your server can easily tip over and uh, that's not great in production. If you want to do this in Kubernetes, then it's, uh, it's even harder. But let's take a closer look at the very beginning of this slide. Uh, how is it possible that, okay, you have a single Python program, but how is it possible to have uh, two languages in a single program? Uh, the C program, the kernel space program, is there as a string. If you take a look at these, uh, I'm not sure Maybe it's readable from the first few rows, but basically that's the Python program. Uh, you can look it up on, on GitHub. And there, at the beginning, there's a BPF text variable, and that variable is a string, and that has the kernel space program, which is not the best way to write software in 2023, <laughs> especially if you want to uh, load it into the kernel uh, and, uh, and in production. So there are some challenges. You can do it better by following the uh, BPF core principles. And the core means compile once run everywhere. Basically, this came together with having the BTF type information available on your system in forms of a VM Linux.h header file. You still have to have Clang as the compiler and the Lean BPF uh, user space uh, loader linker library. But basically, if you have these, then what you can do is that you can, um, everything will be in C, which is already a benefit. But the, the best thing is that you can compile them in advance and you can, it's a portable, it's a quite portable uh, little package that you can drop onto another production machine and you don't need to uh, compile it at runtime, it will be pre-compiled and uh, it should do the job, which is better than the previous way but still, you have to write uh, user space code in C, you have to write the kernel code and the user space code. Who, who cares about the user space code? Uh, I want to work on the kernel because that's eBPF and uh, that's, the, that's where the most interesting uh, things are. So what if you could only write the kernel program? And, program? and that's basically the promise uh, of Bumblebee. And if you go back to the landscape, uh, we can see that Bumblebee is there, was there. And with Bumblebee, uh, you can build, publish, and run eBPF programs uh, in, in cloud providers, cl uh, Kubernetes clusters, anywhere without writing a single line of user space code. Bumblebee, as I mentioned, can help to build these. Uh, portability is still challenging. So with Bumblebee, uh, without Bumblebee, you still have to uh, put that compiled uh, eBPF uh, package to the production system somehow. But with Bumblebee, you have a Docker-like uh, user experience, dev experience, because you can basically compile your eBPF programs into OCI-compatible containers, package those, put those into repositories. You can do something like uh, B build 
reference your code and be uh, push. And just like with Docker, you can push that into uh, an upstream repository. And what is really great is that, as I mentioned, you don't need to write user space code. And that's true because Bumblebee has a text-based user interface that can visualize everything for you. But that might not be the best in a production environment. But what you can also do is that it can auto-generate Prometheus metrics automatically. And most probably, you have Prometheus running in your clusters. Who has Prometheus running in, their, in a Kubernetes cluster? OK, I think that's. I, I won't see more hands than this uh, during this talk. So it's quite nice. You don't need to write a single line of user space code. You just write your kernel space code. Or even better, you can take one of the examples from the um, BCC repository and uh, package it with Bumblebee. Um, there's this video. It's very short. But you can see uh, what the development, developer experience uh, looks like. So there's the code, umkill.c. Then you do something like b build umkill.c. You can tag it. Push it to a, a local or remote, uh, remote registry. You can run it. That's the user interface that I mentioned. And you can also enable the generation of uh, Prometheus metrics, which is quite nice. OK, this sounds good. Uh, how you can uh, migrate existing tools to, to Bumblebee. Basically, you can go to the aforementioned BCC repository, the same one that I mentioned at the beginning, iovisor, github.com, slash iovisor, organization, slash BCC. And in the BCC repository, there's the uh, libpf tools um, folder. And the libpf tools folder, you can find the uh, the original tools that I mentioned at the beginning are in the BCC slash tools or something like that folder. But in the libpf tools, you have the libpf equivalent of all the tools. What does that mean is that uh, all of those are following the core principles. These are quite portable. Um, most of the time, you will find two two files per tool. One of them is .c, and the other one is a bpf.c. The regular .c is the file that you can forget about, because that's the user space logic. There's no need to take a look at that, only if you are interested. And the umkill.bpf.c in this example is the actual kernel space code. So after that, you just take a look at the kernel space code that you have there, and you check what kind of uh, map type is being used in that example. And if it's using hash map or ring buffer, then you are good to go, because Bumblebee currently de uh, supports these two um, map types. Um, so if it's using uh, perf buffer, which is, we can say that it's a legacy uh, map type, then you have to uh, migrate that into uh, ring buffer, because ring buffer is the main uh, supported and modern um, map type uh, that is supported by Bumblebee. So you can just make this migration. Uh, to, to see an actual migration like this, you can um, either go to academy.slow.io, as, as I mentioned. You just register there, and you have an actual virtual environment in your browser. You don't need to fear that you will crash your kernel, because for once, you have the verifier, so you cannot really. But in the, in the academy.slow.io, you have a virtual environment running in your browser that is provisioning a Kubernetes cluster for you, and you can do everything there. So it's a really safe. Uh, even if the verifier cannot catch an issue, it won't be your uh, Kubernetes cluster that will die. So I think uh, that's the safest way to get started with DBPF. Or you can also go to the solo.io blog and search for Bumblebee, and there will be a blog spot uh, written by me that covers the migration of this umkill.c uh, example, uh, line by line, what you need to do. And basically, you can follow the same strategy for all the other examples. On this slide, you can see the roadmap for, for Bumblebee itself. We are trying to keep up with all the libpf developments. Uh, what is missing currently is tighter Kubernetes integration. So we are actually collaborating with uh, Inspector Gadget, the Kim Fork forks from, uh, um, from, from Germany, actually. Uh, they were acquired by uh, Microsoft a couple of years ago. And we are working with them together to, to use um, Bumblebee in Inspector Gadget as a packaging layer. 
We are also looking into adding new map types, uh, have proper logging support, histogram support in terms of Prometheus metrics, and just adding new examples from the upstream basis repository. And all of these are um, available for anyone to, to work on. So if someone is interested in contributing to Bumblebee or to get familiar with DBPF, I can recommend checking out our uh, GitHub repository uh, in the solo.io organization. So these are the takeaways. As I mentioned, DBPF is a game changer for observability. Um, focusing on kernel space can be fun, and it's even uh, better if you don't have to um, focus on the actual user space code, because that's a bit more boring. Uh, integration is key, so it's quite nice that you can integrate with Prometheus right away, because most probably the user will have Prometheus. So it's a quite nice way to, to visualize your uh, kernel events. And uh, we are just getting started. So as I mentioned, uh, free, um, check out our GitHub repo and um, see what comes next uh, for, for Bumblebee. That's the website, academy.solo.io. That's our Slack. There's a Bumblebee channel. If you have any questions, feel free to join and, um, and ask questions. And uh, thank you for joining the session. Excellent, Christian. Thank you so much. Uh, actually, the next speakers, Andy and Christopher, if you can go and get mic'd up, that would be excellent. <laughs> um, uh, and then we have a little bit of time for questions, so that's that's uh, that's good. Um, so I mentioned your over-engineered blog, and people want to know the the URL for that uh, for that one. So is that something you can share? What is the URL of your over-engineering blog? Yeah, it's it's my name. So it's christianfaketa.org. O R G. <laughs> If you go to uh, his Twitter profile, you can also find it. Uh, I've been checking it out already. Um, so th that, that's that's one. Uh, there was some outrage about uh, you know eBPF not uh, creating a backdoor but blowing up your front door instead, which I think is uh, uh, excellently framed. Uh, you did you did cover it some uh, somewhat later in your talk, but maybe you want to still uh, comment on this question. For the sake and safety of kernels, why eBPF looks not like creating a backdoor but blowing up your front door instead? <laughs> I'm not sure what to say, um, how to react for uh, for that. eBPF is, is quite safe. I <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not the best marketing, but basically in my life I have never seen a crashed kernel that crashed because of eBPF. So. Yet. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I think it's, it's, it's pretty rare. OK, I, I again use the word pretty, but it, it, can, it cannot really happen. <laughs> I'm, I'm not doing a better job, but <laughs> lots, of, lots of people are using it in production. Uh, there are far more dangerous tools that you are already running in production that you shouldn't. And uh, if that's fine, then I think eBPF, the, the benefits of using eBPF uh, can outweigh the, uh, the cons. <laughs> Exactly. Anyone using NPM? <laughs> um, do you have any cl clever use cases of uh, custom eBPF rules that you can share? Yeah, I think you can. Just to get started, you can check, uh, check out the Bumblebee repository on GitHub. And there you will find an examples folder. And in the examples folder, folder there are lots of uh, existing examples that we ported to Bumblebee. And there you can find the umkill.c example. And I think that's my favorite because it's a quite small program, it's like, it's like uh, 15 lines of code, and uh, catching out of memory exceptions without eBPF can be really challenging. There are other tools to do that. Those can catch most of the out of memory exceptions, uh, but I, in, my, in my career, I had the highest chance of catching actual out of memory exceptions, even the so-called invisible ones when your process is forking another process, and that process get um killed. There are whole lots of different edge cases that are quite invis invisible to, to traditional uh, monitoring tools. For example, the, the Prometheus metric that is coming from C Advisor, um, that's also a, that, that can get most of them, but, but not all of them. So eBPF for out of memory exceptions is, is a great example, I think, one of the most useful uh, example in terms of the officer royalty. All right, well, thank you so much, Christian. And uh, let's take a eight minute-ish pause until we start with the next talk. Uh, give Christian a warm round of applause, please. Thank you.